It was 40 degrees below zero. It was a murderous job. Our cheeks were immediately frostbitten. Our mom massaged them with the snow to ease the frostbite. That winter, we worked on removing snow. Our chimney fell down and I built a stove. We needed to repair the chimney on the roof because the wind would blow the smoke back into the room. So I went up onto the roof, in this terrible cold, with hot water from the house to soak my hands in, and with mud and brick I built a new chimney, but the price was high. I got terribly sick. My legs were covered with flat, red tumors, and I couldn't walk. It was erythema nodosum. I had to lie in bed for five weeks in a terrible condition. I got better. In February, I walked to get straw, and in this way, we survived the terrible Siberian winter, our first Siberian winter. My aunt, who stayed in our town in Poland, in Augustów, had a nice, large apartment, two big rooms and a kitchen. One room was taken by two Russians, soldiers from the Russian army who had been assigned to watch the borders. They were very good men. Sometimes they brought her different things, which she put in packages and sent to us. Those packages from her helped enormously. Often we didn't even know who sent them. We didn't see the names. It turned out that many of the packages had been sent by our classmates. We got a lot of packages, flour, buckwheat, lard, bacon. Can you imagine? The Russians at the post office didn't destroy the packages. We got them in one piece. The soldiers who lived in my aunt's apartment told her to write a letter to my mom. They said to send her the addresses of the general prosecutor in Moscow in order for her to write a letter to him asking him to tell us where our father was and for permission for him to join us, or at least for us to be able to send letters to him, to correspond with him. My mom sent the letters. There was no answer for a long time. Eventually, at the beginning of April 1941, there was an answer. The NKVD commander-in-chief summoned us into his office in a village called Yavlenka. We decided that my mom and I would go to this village. It was 37 miles from where we were, to learn what he wanted and maybe where our father was. So we went. We had to dress warm. My mom put on a sheepskin fur. I put on my school coat. We did not have pants, so we put skirts on, socks, and shoes, but the snow was already starting to melt. We knew that in order to go 37 miles, that we were going to have to walk for three days. The first night we spent in a village called Sovietskoye, nine miles from our home, at the home of some acquaintances named Novieli Sovye. The second night we spent in the village called Tarangul, where there were a lot of deported Polish families, mainly wives of the officers from Luck and Volin. The third night, we reached Yavlenka, where we had a friend who was the wife of an officer and a dentist. There is a story about her. Once, a very strange man had visited us in the first Siberian village we had lived in, called Poputnia. He had a slightly graying beard and a mustache. He was tall, handsome. It turned out he was Iranian and had been sentenced and deported to Siberia for 10 years for having an Iranian passport. His wife was Russian. She lived in Leningrad, she taught at the university, and he spent 10 years deported in Siberia. Because he was an engineer, he was superintendent of construction in the Liniski region, so he had a lot of contact with the Poles. They built, for instance, a cowshed in our village. And, among other things, he had Mrs. Stanislawa's address, the woman that I was speaking of, and he gave it to us. 
So my older sister, who had graduated with one of Mrs. Stanislawa's siblings in 1939 and was close with them, went to visit her. It turned out that Mrs. Stanislawa's little daughter was really ill. We did not know if she would recover. One day, Mrs. Stanislawa dragged herself and her four-year-old son to our place and told us her story. She had taken her two young children in her arms and walked 37 miles with them to the hospital. Her daughter was only one year old. She got terribly ill, and in the village where they lived, there wasn't any doctor to help. When she got to Yavlenka, to the hospital, she started to work for the hospital, washing dishes in the kitchen, to provide for her children. On July 26, the daughter said, Mama, and died. She buried her in a wooden box at the Yavlenka Cemetery. She returned to her village with her young son to live with her mother-in-law, who had also been deported, but decided to go back to Yavlenka to work in the hospital, and she did. But in this village where they lived, she witnessed a terrible tragedy. In this village, there also lived a wife of a mayor from Volkovysk, a city in the eastern part of Poland with a big soldier's garrison, as every city on the eastern border of Poland had. The mayor's wife had been deported with her 16-year-old son. He had a pain in his abdomen. It was his appendix. She asked the head of the farm to get horses to send for a doctor. He said, horses for you? You were brought here to die like an animal. This woman knelt at his feet and kissed his shoes and begged him for horses. He did not allow that she should have horses. Her son died in her arms in terrible pain. This is how we were treated by the Russians, and there is no excuse, no excuses for this. No, there is not.